In chapter seven, we're going to shift our focus back to T cells now. We looked at how T cells um, recognize antigen in chapter five, but now let's go and take a deeper look at how they develop those antigen receptors. And so let's start out by taking a peek at an overview of what's going to be in this, um, in this set of lectures. So T cells are, they're lymphocytes. And so just like any other lymphocyte or blood cell, white blood cell, red blood cell, they're going to be created from the hematopoietic stem cell in the bone marrow. And so they originate from the bone marrow, but at a very early immature point of development, they actually leave the bone marrow and move to the thymus to, to mature. That's when their T cell receptors are going to be made. And that's when they're going to get their antigen specificity and become mature T cells. When a T cell then becomes mature, then it will leave the thymus and move out into the secondary lymphoid tissue to be looking for infection. So that's kind of the, the big story. And if we take and we compare B cells next to T cells, because we spent a lot of time looking at B cells, in chapter six, both B cells and T cells are from that lymphoid lineage that comes from the hematopoietic stem cell. But, so they're both created in the bone marrow, but when they start to rearrange their receptors, whether it's the B cell receptor for the B cells or the T cell receptor for the T cells, that rearrangement, somatic recombination is going to occur in different locations. We saw previously that the B cell stays in the bone marrow to go through somatic recombination. T cells, however, will do their somatic recombination in the thymus. So the heavy and light chains are created in the bone marrow for the B cell receptor. The alpha beta chains or gamma delta chains are created in the thymus for the T cell. And then, in, then that's pretty, you know, pretty nice that we have T cells for thymus, but um, B cells, like we mentioned previously, is that it doesn't stand for bone marrow. It'd be pretty great if it did, but it stands for bursa, which bursa is like the bone marrow in birds. So it's kind of, you kind of get a two for their bird bone marrow B cells, bursa. <laughs> so anyways, B cells, bone marrow, T cells, thymus, that's where that education occurs. And in the end, what we can have then is a T cell receptor that um, will recognize antigen. But recall that a T cell receptor can't recognize antigen in isolation, but rather that peptide fragment has to be displayed in conjunction with an MHC class one or two molecule, depending on the type of antigen. And so a major part of T cell development uh, is going to ensure that T cells have T cell receptors that can recognize antigen in the context or in association with MHC molecules. So both class one and class two isoforms um, are going to be um, necessary for recognition. And so that's a big part of T cell development, not only antigen specificity, but also um, the, ca the capacity to recognize MHC molecules. Okay, so that's kind of the overview. But before we get too deep into T cell development, I want to take just a few moments to speak in depth about the thymus as a tissue. It is a primary lymphoid organ. We have the two primary lymphoid organs. We have the bone marrow and we have the thymus. And uh, it is located above the heart in the upper um, anterior thorax. So it's going to be just kind of like below the throat, above the heart kind of area. And its whole major function is just to educate T cells. That's the whole function of the thymus. So it contains a variety of cells, but mostly it's going to contain immature T cells called thymocytes. I don't know how often that word is used anymore. Um, you know, I guess lots of times we're not talking about immature forms, but an immature form would be a, a, a thymocyte. And they are embedded in this network of epithelial cells that we call the thymic stroma. 
So we'll look at a picture, a schematic here in the next slide, but this picture you can see there's all of these epithelial cells that create this, this structure. And then you have all of these thymocytes that are embedded within there. And so that structure is created by the um, thymic epithelial cells. And then um, those little thymocytes just kind of reside all over in any open space. It does get pretty tight. There's the outer cortex, which is going to be um, more tightly packed with thymocytes and epithelial cells. And then the closer you get towards the center of the thymus, it's going to loosen up a little bit and become less dense. And you're going to have more um, myeloid dendritic cells um, rather than the epithelial cells. And so we'll look at a drawing of that in a little bit. But again, it is one of the primary lymphoid organs. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison of a, um, a microscopic image on the left where we have the, um, you, it's kind of shaped, and then we have a drawing, a schematic here on the, on the right, but you can kind of see the shape, this kind of outer here, that is kind of supposed to be like this outer. So uh, you can kind of see how it fits together. And so that outer upper area here, that's going to be the cortex. And then the medulla is more towards the center. And you can definitely see how much more packed it is up in this kind of outer area than it is down when you get down into the medulla type area, it's less dense. Um, and so we have our thymic epithelial cells out on the outside. We have our myeloid dendritic cells more towards the medulla. And then we have all the thymocytes developing uh, T cells uh, scattered throughout. Now, during fetal development, when baby is being developed in mom, uh, the thymus is going to be um, colonized by these cells that eventually become the thymocytes and they're going to become dendritic cells, but you know they start out in the bone marrow, then they move in there, but then the macrophages are also going to come into the area because it's important to have macrophages anywhere in the tissue to clean up dead cells. And we'll see how cells die uh, in the thymus. So it's a very active environment of cells and interactions that will lead to a fully mature T cell that is able to recognize antigen. So I'm going to zoom in now just on the schematic and let's talk about the process or the way T cells move in. So we call it a T cell progenitor because it's not an immature T cell yet, but rather it's one of those very immature forms. It's not a stem cell. Uh, it's not a hematopoietic stem cell. It's a little bit at least differentiated to the point that it's committed to being a T cell. So it's not an uncommitted lymphoid lineage, but rather a T cell committed progenitor cell that this junction, this corticomedullary junction it will enter and then it will move its way through the thymus during development. And I have that little red squiggle on there to show like how a th uh, thymocyte might, you know, move on its way through. But largely what happens is it will move out through the cortex and then it will slowly migrate back down through uh, the medulla and then end up leaving the thymus at the end of its path um, because it's mature and it can go out and look for infection. Uh, but what's also really crazy about the thymus is that it does the bulk of its work um, within the first few years of life. And so here's a diagram that shows the functional, I have my pan is a little short here, um, the functional thymus um, in percentage. So we have the percentage here on the y-axis and like you have about, you have about nearly a hundred percent, you know, 90%. And then puberty hits and you're only about at 50% after, uh, right around puberty, shortly after puberty. And you're sitting there at about 50% um, function. And then, man, after that, it really goes downhill. By the time you hit 50, you practically have no thymus left at all. And so it is one that continues, it's an organ that will continue to degrade throughout life 
until mostly just fat by the time you're 50. And by that time, hopefully you have all the T cell specificities that you need. There's still a little bit of function, but it's not going to be anywhere near what you had in the earlier years of life. And this process is called involution. So a thymus will go through involution and then really just become fat after a while. Uh, so over time, like right away, the first, you know, 15 years of your life, you're really making pumping up T cells and then um, um, with different specificities. Um, but it doesn't, even though as you get older, you're not making a whole lot of new T cell specificity, it doesn't harm you, doesn't make you less um doesn't lessen your ability to fight infection because what's probably happened is your T cell repertoire is completely built by the time you're, you know, 15, 20 years old. And those T cells are very long lived. And so they seem to hang around for life. And then hopefully, you know, they, they get a chance to interact with their antigen or maybe not, hopefully it depends on how you look at it. But once established that repertoire is going to be there for life, even if you don't have um, much of a thymus left. Okay, I want to stop there um, because now we have like a background of a basis. We know what the thymus is, we know what the structure is and how it kind of works, and we know that T cells are going to start in the bone marrow and, and become educated in the thymus. We'll look at the details of that uh, in the next lecture.